possibility that until you heard the reading of our devotional reading a few moments ago, you were not aware that God was a buckler. And now, you're clueless as to what that means. A buckler was the small shield that was used in the first century and before for close, in tight fighting. And this passage pictures the wisdom and the understanding that is possible from God's divine message that places us in the position of having God who is our shield, our protection. He who sticks close by us and keeps us from taking those blows that would, in fact, destroy our spiritual lives. And it's in relation to that that we're going to be examining a topic this morning that might seem somewhat odd, but maybe not after we go into the lesson a tad. First thing I want us to do is let you be on the receiving end of me telling you something about some fellas that I have known. The first fellow's name is Dickie Deets. The second guy's name is Ron Hunt. Third guy's name is Hal Lanier. And closing out these first four fellas is Jim Davenport. These are some fellas that are near and dear to me and have been near and dear to me for many, many years. Many more years than I've known most of you. But you probably are clueless as to who these guys in actuality are. If I was to put in front of them these symbols, then you might be more out to grasp their significance, at least in the world of sport. Because when you put a C in front of Dick Dietz, you put a 2B and a SS and a 3B in front of the next three guys, then you would see, if you have any knowledge whatsoever of box scores, that these are infielders, a catcher, a second baseman, a shortstop, and also the third baseman for the 1969 San Francisco Giants. Somebody says, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, they played alongside Willie McCovey who, of course, is a member of Baseball's Hall of Fame. They also played in the infield in which the center fielder was none other than the greatest baseball player that's ever lived. His name was Willie Mays. You see, that's not even taking into consideration the pitching staff that they had. Mike McCormick, as a matter of fact, won, of all things, the Cy Young Award in 1964. And Gaylord Perry, while he did not win the Cy Young Award for the San Francisco Giants, he was the first man to win the Cy Young in both the American League and the National League. And then there's one Marichal. Yes, friends, this man was a high-kicking Dominican Republic man who had the audacity to hit John Roseborough over the top of the head because John Roseborough threw the ball back to the pitcher, Sandy Koufax, a little bit too close to his ear. Somebody says, what is all that about? Friends, when I tell you about these guys, I'm telling you about guys that I knew a whole lot about when there used to be this thing called the game of the week. And that carries with it the idea that you'd naturally expect. There was one baseball game a week. Just one. And during that time, which was some 42 to 43 years ago, I could talk baseball with adults, knowing the batting averages, knowing the on-base percentages, knowing the slugging percentages, knowing all the statistics there is to know about baseball. And I didn't have to talk to myself either. There was always a willing accomplice to sit and talk baseball with other baseball fans. But why? I do believe that at that period of time, I could have took a youngster, and I tried this with him. 
I could take a youngster and I could so infiltrate his mind with statistics and saying all of the wonderful things to be said about the San Francisco Giants that anybody in their right mind would ultimately become a San Francisco Giants fan. I guess you could probably call me a San Francisco Giant evangelist. You see, what I said about me is not really a whole lot different than what most of us could say about ourselves, although there's probably very few that are San Francisco Giant evangelists. Y'all would be evangelists for other teams other than them. But will we really use the word evangelist, though? Doesn't the word evangelist carry with it more an idea of a spiritual connotation other than a baseball connotation? The word evangelist, and it's only found at least in that form three times in the New Testament. It's found carrying with the idea that you can see as obvious in these passages that I'm going to show you. The first place, of course, is as Paul is traveling, making his way back to the city of Jerusalem, where he knows that he's going to face certain uh, being confined in prison by the Jews, that in his traveling back to that city, he and his traveling companions, some seven, make their way to Caesarea, and they entered into the house of a man named Philip, who is described as being the evangelist. And of course, the reason why we know that he is an evangelist is not just because this pastor of Scripture identifies him as being such. We know what he did. We know what he did in his spare time. We know what he did when it wasn't his spare time. We know it was he who made his way to Samaria in Acts chapter 8. After the disciples were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word, he was one of them that made his way to Samaria and preached Jesus to those people to the extent that many of those people hearing the message of salvation and seeing the miracles that he performed were obedient to what he said do, and they were baptized for the remission of their sins, both men and women. And then, of course, it was this same Philip who was, constru- who was instructed by the Lord to go and to join himself to a man who was traveling home to Ethiopia who had been to Jerusalem far to worship. Philip the evangelist. But there's other passages that help us to understand as well what's involved in this. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, after Paul has told Timothy to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, he tells him specifically, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Therefore, there has to be a correlation between what Philip was doing as he receives that designation of him in Acts chapter 21 and what Timothy was doing and what Timothy was as this designation by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. And then in the midst of Ephesians chapter 4, we find Paul making this assessment. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And, of course, the very next verse tells us this was the purpose for these various positions, these various offices, these various works, was for the building up of the body of Christ until man could become full in Christ, and with that completed revelation, that actually took place. Evangelist. An evangelist is a person who announces good news, or he brings glad tidings to others. Friends, to know all of the particulars about the San Francisco Giants certainly, in my mind, fits into the category of good things and glad tidings. A whole lot better good things and glad tidings than you'll see reading in the news this morning, I guarantee you that. Therefore, those who were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. So says Acts chapter 8 at verse 4. 
And that word that is translated preaching there is the word from which we get our word evangelist. If you'll notice, even in the Greek, it looks like evangelist, doesn't it? What were they doing? They were going to places, even some of them home, with the message of salvation that they had learned in Jerusalem. And the persecution that resulted in the martyrdom of Stephen made them go home, and as they went home, they went home with the gospel as evangelists. And so we have this in a, in a very loose sense, this concept of evangelist. A San Francisco giant evangelist. An Atlanta Braves evangelist. A volunteer evangelist. Country music evangelist. Rock and roll evangelist. American Idol evangelist. Who knows what kind of evangelist that is? Who knows what kind of evangelist? Those are all types of things that are near and dear to our heart, lest we say they are good things. Things that, as a matter of fact, occupy a whole lot of our thinking, occupy a whole lot of our time, and a whole lot of our energy. Right? These evangelists that I'm talking about, and I'll be one of them, they talk about their favorite team. They talk about their favorite game. It's not professional basketball. They talk about their favorite band, their favorite TV show, their favorite movie, and they talk about these things hours and hours and hours. And when they can talk no longer, they text about it. And when they can text no longer, they type about it on the Internet. And we all do that to a certain extent. What's the point then? The point is that we put time and energy into things that we care a lot about. Don't. As a matter of fact, we know a whole lot of stuff about the things that we care a lot about, including the San Francisco job. We do that. Now, let's be honest for a minute. If we became enthusiastic about a team, a song, a singer, a movie, or a TV show, then those around about us will find out about that Sooner or later. And probably sooner, right? If we absolutely detest the decision that was made on a game show, maybe a game show in which people are vying for the next American Idol, then we talk about that from when we get to work until we go home from work and then some, right? Let's ask ourselves these questions. Do my co-workers, do my classmates know that I'm a Christian? Do they know which congregation I'm a member of? Do they know what I believe? I mean, not about the judges on American Idol. I mean what I believe about moral issues that are facing us in this country. Do they know what I believe? And then, maybe just as importantly, do they know why I believe those things? You see, these things would fit into the category of a responsibility that is each and every one of ours. In 1 Peter chapter 3, at verse 15, Peter says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and with fear. Why do you do what you do? Why do you go where you go? Why do you refrain from going where you refrain from going? 
Why is it that there are certain movies that you will not go see? Why is it that there are certain clothes that you will not wear in public? Why? 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 All oh, those questions have never come up. Have those other questions come up? Why? 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 Let's be honest. If they don't know whether I'm a Christian or not, but they do know what my favorite team is. They do know what my favorite football team is, my baseball team is, my basketball team is, my color is, my movie is, my television show is. They know all those things. Does that not indicate that there is a, a great gap that exists between where my priorities ought to lie? If they know those things that ultimately, friends and brethren, do not amount to a hill of beans, but things that really do matter, they're clueless about. Would it be pride at all to say that something's wrong in a situation such as this? Let's to look at two examples, and the lesson will be yours. The first lesson I want us to look to is a lesson from four lepers. And these lepers are actually told about back in 2 Kings chapter 7 at verse 9. Now, let me set the, the historical background for this one verse of Scripture. Ben Hadad is the king of Syria. He has the city of Samaria along with the king of the northern kingdom, under siege. That means that Samaria is completely surrounded. Nobody gets in. Nobody gets out. They're going to starve the inhabitants out of the city. Don't let the Walmart truck in. Don't let the potato chip man in. Don't let nobody in and don't let nobody out. And so, after a period of time the head of an animal that is unfit to eat under normal circumstances is bringing forth an exorbitant sum of money because people are literally starving to death. It's a desperate time, it's a miracle. This builds up over weeks. And weeks turns into months. And they are literally being starved out. To the point where everyone is nearly famished. And some of them have even resorted to cannibalizing their children. Yes, friend, it's bad. And there's four lepers. And they say, all right, we're going to go out here and throw ourselves on the mercy of our enemy. If they kill us, at least we'll be past starving to death. And who knows, they might have some sympathy for us and might give us something to eat. And so they start making their way to the enemy's camp. <clears throat> and it's very quiet. And they can't understand it. And when they get to the actual outskirts of the camp, they don't see anybody, they don't hear anybody. And they go in the camp and there's nobody there. Everybody's gone. And they have left without their provision. You see, God, during the night, has made them hear the sound of chariots. And they think that the king of the northern kingdom of Israel has got him some mercenaries from the area kingdom, and they are now fighting on his side. And so it scares the Syrians, and they leave and leave everything as it is in the campsite. Food, water, silver, gold, everything that you could imagine. And these lepers walk into the midst of all that. And they run from one tent to the other eating. You can almost see them scarfing it down. They've been starving to death. And now they have all this plenty. And then finally... One of the lepers makes this statement. Then said one to another, 
we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. What's their attitude? Their attitude is, we have been blessed exceedingly to be able to come and feel our need for food and water. It would be absolutely wrong for us to sit here and try to eat it all because we can't. The only right thing to do, the only human thing to do, is to go and to tell our friends and those who have been captive for all these months that here is plenty for everybody to eat. And that's what they did. They went and told everybody else how they had been blessed. As a matter of fact, they saw it as being a sin if they kept their mouth shut when they had been so blessed. Rick, it was. Another example. A lesson from Jeremiah. Sort of a different twist, but the same outcome nonetheless. Jeremiah, of course, was chosen from his mother's womb while he's still in the womb to be a great prophet for God in Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 20, at verse 9, things have got to the point where Jeremiah determined, I am going to close my mouth for good. Well, what happened? Then said I, I will not make mention of him, that's God, nor speak any more in his name. But the word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not. Say, or in other words, I couldn't contain myself. I had to preach. I could not keep my mouth closed. Now, what was it that would have caused Jeremiah to feel as though he needed to just quit preaching and just to keep his mouth shut about anything from God? Well, the next few verses tell us. They mocked Jeremiah. They spread lies about Jeremiah. They tried every way they could to intimidate Jeremiah, to keep him from preaching the truth. Those who were his very closest, closest friends, if you want to use the word friends, were in fact working to bring about his defeat. And the fact is, these are the ones who are ultimately going to be ashamed of themselves, and not just for a little while, they're going to be ashamed of themselves eternally because of what they've done. You see, the example of Jeremiah and the example of the lepers is one that surely we can see the import of. Let me ask you this. Does the Bible affect you in the same way? Say, is it affected Jeremiah? or in relation to the good that you have been able to experience from God's bountiful hand, as in the case with the four lepers. Does the Bible affect you in the same way that it affected Jeremiah? Does the Bible affect you in some way? Does the Bible affect you in any way? For example, in Acts chapter 4 and 5, Peter and John are on trial for preaching the gospel. The Sanhedrin, which is the 70-some-odd men who serve as sort of a supreme court over the nation of Israel, have admitted that a notable miracle has been performed. And so they bring in Peter and John, and they command them not to Speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, 
whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You see, that's just another way of saying Mr. Political and Religious Authority, would reality be an acceptable thing for us to speak about? Would the truth be all right for us to talk about? Would the facts of the case be all right to relate? You can beat it. You can kill it. But we're not shutting our mouth about Jesus of Nazareth. Why not? Because of what they had been benefited, it was just absolutely way too much for them to be quiet about. Now here's that honesty thing one more time. When Jesus changes our lives, should we want to hold it in and hide it from everyone else around about us? And is not God's love extended toward us and the plan of salvation that He's provided for us, is that not at least as important as the latest songs on the radio? Or the latest winner of some contest? or the latest home run hitter to make his way into the big league. To ask, obviously, is to answer, is it not? Certainly, it is. The question that is asked and answered in Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, is our concluding verse. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth, on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. God has a simple plan. It involves hearing the right thing because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It involves believing that which you hear, inclusive of the fact that Jesus Christ is who He claimed to be. It involves repenting of one's sin. It involves confessing one's faith in Christ and being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins so that the Lord might add you to His church. It may be possible that in times past, one or more obeyed that simple plan, but have wandered back into the world and need to be restored to a right relationship with God. It is our prayer, it is our hope, and the determination for the choosing of a song of invitation that would encourage you to come to Jesus even right now, while together we stand and while we sing.